Good morning, Vietnam. <laughs> I wanted to <clears throat> record this particular time in my life to give you an example of the challenges, the situations, the circumstances that we all go through, whether you be in ministry, whether you be an individual, whether you find yourself in those perplexities, those trials and tribulations that don't fit the example of what you've been told faith is. Faith is the confidence of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. But we know that we can define it. We really can't describe how it actually works in our life because it's a person who's working in our life, not an object. If we said that it was the object of faith that works in our life, then we would be making God removed from the picture and we would be making the promises of God the worship of those things that God has said as opposed to the personal relationship of having to deal with the living God. We don't actually know what God's purpose is sometimes in what he's doing in our life. We think we do. But you see, man looks on the outward things, but God looks on the heart. God always has something better in store for us, even if it's worse than what we might imagine. In other words, the best that God could want for you is to die and to go to heaven. Seriously, that's one of the best things that could happen to you. And yet for some of you, I'm sure that is one of the worst things that you could imagine. Because in some ways, you can't imagine God doing something like that in your life. You can't imagine that losing everything you have could be a good thing. And yet, that's kind of what God said as far as faith was concerned. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence is not yet seen. Our faith is to direct us to have a personal relationship with God. Not to have the possessions of the worldly gains not to be prosperous, not to have monies, not to have cars, not to have the American dream, but to have something that's more precious than gold, more precious than silver, and that is the absolute certainty that when you close your eyes in death, you'll go home to be with the Lord. I wanted to share this particular time in my life because <laughs> I'm really going through it in my life. Oh, not as though I were going to, you know, like, be overcome by it, for me, possessions are meaningless. You know, I spent my entire life learning to dispossess myself of my possessions so that nothing would hold me. That if I gained the world and lost my very soul, that would be the absolute horror that I would face. And so I've always said that, hey, you know, I don't have a problem with giving up the world. That's the easy part. I have a problem with those that are living in the world and are of the world and then tell me that I'm the fool. So right now, going through this time, I want to call it the trying of my faith or the trial or Michael on trial or however you want to look at the preacher being tested or you know anything that you want to call it. But I wanted to at least give an example of those that have committed their lives unto the Lord Jesus Christ and the keeping thereof unto his salvation and not our own. Because you see, right now in my life, facing one of those trials where it's like, oh no, now where do we go? It's like everything has been brought up to this crisis moment of what should I do? Should I turn to the left? Should I turn to the right? Should I go forward? Should I go back? Should I be still and wait on the Lord? Oftentimes in our life, we are people of action. We choose to, as the psychologist will tell us, fight or flight. We either run from or run to a given circumstance or situation where we feel fear from or fear of. And we'll either run at it or run away from it. And you see that a lot of times in, you know, a big bomb or an explosion or something. And God wants us to not be either one of those fight or flight types of people. God wants us to trust in the Lord with all our heart, to lean not in our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge him and have him direct our path. And in choosing to follow that direction, 
one of the things that this ministry that me personally and my wife now physically are going through is to trust in the Lord with all our heart. To lean not in our own understanding, but to in all our ways acknowledge him and let him direct our path. God brought us where we are today. We're in a building, in a house, we're in an apartment, we're doing the ministry. We've done everything to use all of our means and opportunities to continue on in the faith. To help others as opposed to helping ourselves. To minister to others as well as to plan for the future and to be prepared for the times that we live in, the struggles, the challenges. And so we did that. And God blessed our efforts in many ways. We wound up with some health benefits that for me personally is a big deal, you know, because quite frankly, you know, with my ostomy and expenses, you know, it would be like huge in expense. And I don't mind suffering, you know, and having to pay for it myself, but it is a big expense. And it takes away from budgets and those kinds of things that, you know, you need to pay for electricity or pay for your roofing or housing or car. And I've been to the place where I've had no roofing or housing or car, where I did not know where I was going to go or what I was going to do. As a matter of fact, several times as a missionary that happened to me when I was in Israel. When I was in Israel, I went to Israel originally and was in one location as I was, you know, planning on getting involved in different places and was thrown out of it. It was a Jewish thing and it was supposed to be provided for me and they said I couldn't stay there. So I moved out. I had no place to go. And when I was standing there at the east gate of Jerusalem as I was getting ready, or Damascus, not Damascus gate, the east gate, no, the west gate. It's got to be the west gate. Yeah. Anyways, while I was standing, Jaffa gate, while I was standing there at Jaffa gate, I was not knowing where I was going to go. I had just about choked up to that place where tears were about ready to come to my eyes. And uh, I really didn't know what I was going to do. I was down to probably, you know, I don't know, maybe a few bucks, you know, American, which, you know, didn't convert to much in shekels in those days. But I remember a little boy. First of all, I remember the first thing that happened was that the crowds were going by me and I was standing there with my backpack, you know, and I had, you know, my backpack, basically, that's all I had, really. It was a tent inside, but, you know, I didn't know what I was doing, and I didn't know where I was going, and I didn't know how I was going to do it. And I remember the fear, you know, that was there. Oh, it's fear. It's worry. It's stress. It's compression. It's like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? And in those moments, you don't feel like you have any faith. You don't feel like there is faith. I mean, I had been a Christian for, at that time, oh, probably about 24 years at least, and uh, that's a long time to be a Christian and go through some pretty interesting life experiences to prepare me for that. And yet, there I was, standing in Jaffa Gate in Jerusalem, not knowing what I was going to do. A little boy came up, and well, first of all, a bird came by, and the bird kind of like flew directly into my line of sight, right in front of me, hovered for a moment, just kind of pulled up, almost like he looked at me, and then took off. And it was like... It got my attention. It stopped me from crying. It stopped me. It had, it changed my direction. It was as though it were a slap on the face or a shock to my system. Because I went, that was weird. I didn't think that it was the Holy Spirit, so don't go all spiritual on me or anything. And it didn't feel like any emotions or anything there. I just noticed the bird went, you know, and just took off. Which, you know, if you were at Jaffa Gate, you better take off. Some guy will catch you or do something with you. But with the tourists going by and with everybody going by, I felt a boy, a little boy, you know, tug on my pant leg, you know, or tug on my waist, technically, because he's a little, you know, midget, so to speak, you know, short, and being a little boy, of course. And so he pulled on my, my thing, and, and he didn't say mister or meester, you know, like I, in Mexico. I remember a little boy teaching, pulling on my thing and saying, mister, mister, you know, like, see. <laughs> but... I remember him pulling on my pad leg and he said, follow me, you know, and I, you know, excuse me, you know, I was like, I started to follow. He just pulled on my pad leg and took off. So I followed him into, in through Jaffa Gate and that's in the old city of Jerusalem. And so I went through Jaffa Gate and I went in and as you go in the gate off to the left is the old Mediterranean hotel, which now is called the Petra Hostel. And he took me over there and he took me inside, you know, and then he disappeared. 
and I walked in and went to the desk. You know, I'm not sure why I went to the desk. I didn't. I don't remember him talking to me at all. And I went to the get desk, and he and someone said, you know, did you want a room? And he says, we have this and this and this. And he told me about what the cost was. You know, that you could get a bed for, I guess, a shekel or two. You know, and you could get, you know, all this stuff. And they said, but you know, he saw my tent, my backpack. He says, did you want to camp out on the roof? He said, that's for, you know, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And I don't remember if it was a shekel a night or how cheap it was, but it was so cheap, I could afford it. So I was amazed. I was, like, thrilled. I was, like, all of a sudden excited. Wow, camping out on the roof of the the Mediterranean host, the Mediterranean Hotel, which is famous for David Ben-Gurion and many people from the days of old that had stayed in that hotel that now was owned by an Arab owner, but was owned by, or was um, run as a hostel for travelers. And it was right there in the old city. And it looked out over Temple Mound and all these other things that you could see everywhere. And so I decided to take it. So I stayed up in, for over two or three months, I lived on the roof of the Petra Hostel. But my point is this. I didn't know what I was going to do until the moment God sent that little boy to lead me. A little boy led me. It was terrifying. It was challenging. As a matter of fact, I had personally told everyone that when I went to Jerusalem, I went to die. And God knows I did, <laughs> between him and I. Because there's different kinds of death, and it was a death to a dream, a death to a lot of things. You know, I had gone to Israel, you know, as a pre pre preparing myself for the fact that I probably wasn't going to come back. And I didn't come back the same way I left. It, it changed me in many ways. Jerusalem, if you live there, no matter whether you're Jewish or not, it will change you in very many ways. And most people that, if you're in missionary work, you know that once you've been in the field for a long time, it changes you. You learn to walk by faith and not by sight. Because a lot of times, <clears throat> it could involve your life. It could involve actually physically dying. So, I wanted to share with you this time that I'm going through because it's not as though I haven't been through this before or I may not go through this again. I wanted you to understand that you may not have gone through this before. You may not understand what you're going through. You may not realize that God is taking you through something that you need to understand and comprehend what is his reason for you going through the trial of your faith, going through the testing you're going to endure, going through the challenge that you have in your life this day that God has made you. Hopefully, in some ways, watching how I deal with it, it might inspire you in some ways. Because, I'll be honest, I'm nervous. I'm, I've been with my wife and, you know, working with her and talking to her and seeing what she's been doing and then praying that she finds work and then trying to do what God tells me to do in the ministry and, you know, not be involved. And then also extended ministry, like some of the the carnal stuff that goes on, you know, that you see other people doing and you go, Ooh, you don't want to be involved in that, but you, you know, you kind of like God sends you to him. So you kind of deal with it, you know, and you pray for him from a distance, you know, and, and you know, you see oftentimes like the psalmist says, you know, well, when I, when I see the wicked prosper, you know, and I see the righteous poor, you know, I wonder what's going on, you know, and he says, I, I didn't understand that, David said, you know, until I went into the house of the Lord, I realized what their final end was. You see, in this world, if you are receiving a lot of prosperity and a lot of, you know, wonderful things happening in your life, and you're not getting chastised by the Lord, God's not convicting you of sin or changing you in some ways, I might want to warn you that you might not be a son because whom the Lord loveth, he chaseth us. In other words, whom God loves, he puts through trials. And if you haven't gone through a trial yet in your life, <clears throat> I wonder if you are, in fact, in the life he's given you, eternal life. But if you have gone through trials, let me encourage you. <laughs> you will go through more trials because the working of your faith produces patience. But you have to let patience have its perfect work, that you might be the man of God or the woman of God, fully equipped for every good work indeed that God is bringing you through. The life that I've lived in my life has produced in me the fruit that I now draw upon and I cling to when it comes to those times and trials in my life that I have to look to the Lord alone. 
and to listen to him and to obey his voice and not the voice of another. Because you see, right now it'd be easy for me to pay attention to practical sense. It would be easy for me to go about my common sense. It would be easy for me to just go out and, you know, do a day labor job, get this, that, or the other thing, and to ignore the consequence of my actions. Because if I do those things, there will be a consequence. Oh, I might have immediate satisfaction of working the day and getting my pay. But if God wanted me to obey rather than do, then I might be doing the wrong thing at the wrong time because God wanted me to trust in him. So you see how that works? You may think you know the answer, but that may not be God's way of doing things at that moment you're doing it. <clears throat> in my life, because I'm disabled, I can, quite frankly, put on health. Seriously, I can so mentally force my physical body into putting forth the absolute effort and strength of character that I can do physical body things that it's absolutely impossible for my physical body to endure that for very long. But for the short term, I can do that. I could do it for a week, a month, maybe even a year and pull it off for quite a while until finally the consequences of it catches up with me and I am flat leveled, flat out in hospital beds, dying, perishing, but I don't die. God said he would not, I would not die, but I would declare his works, that I would be kept by the power of his grace, that his mercy would be extended to me so that I could be a testimony and a witness to him of what he can do. Because my health, my physical health, my emotional health, my spiritual health, everything is dependent upon him. If I don't hear from him, I can't do the things I want to do. Oh, I could choose to, this day, go out and find work. I could provide for my family. I could be that, quote unquote, priest in the home, provider, you know, take God's place, you know, and remove the stress from my life that's compressing me and forcing me to my knees to be even possibly crucified at this point in time in my life. But you know, when I asked God, like today, I had to flat, flat out say, well, Lord, I need your word. I need your will. I need your way. I don't need to know <clears throat> what others might do. I don't need to know what others might say, because frankly, I know what they say. You know, it's like, you don't work, you don't eat. You know, it's like, go away. You know, I mean, that's not what the purpose of the church is there for. The purpose of the church is that the poor always should be able to come to the church and find meat in this house. That's what tithing technically is. Tithing was always designed by God for the children of Israel to come to the temple in Jerusalem and to find meat in his house. Not pastors, not teachers, not priests, not Cohens, not anybody else, but to be able to find meat in his house. They could come to the temple, they could come to the tabernacle, and there they would find rest because God would bless them with shelter, with hope, with food, meaning the basic necessities of life. That's what the church is supposed to be about. The church is supposed to also provide for that, being the basic necessities of life, the spiritual life, the physical life, and the emotional life, meaning that its body, soul, and spirit is meant to be there to be encouraged. Unfortunately, in modern American Christianity, we're taught you know, more teaching about you come to me and, you know, hopefully we'll do something about it. Well, that's not really what Jesus did when he was here. But he said that the good shepherd goes after the one and leaves the 99 behind. In American Christianity, unfortunately, we leave the one behind and we go after the 99. It's kind of like messed up in these latter days, but you understand the principle. So on the one hand, I could go out and, you know, try to manipulate all these things, knowing the times that I live in, the situations and the circumstances, and I could pretend that God isn't real. I could pretend that I follow a religious system. I could Christianize my efforts right now, as it were. But you see, I have to also stand before a living God one day. I have to say, Lord, you know, I'm, I wasn't perfect, obviously. I needed your forgiveness and you gave it to me. I needed your mercy and you extended it to me. So what did I do with your mercy and grace, O oh God? I ask you now to lead me today so that I might be an example of your mercy and grace, that I might help others who are in need, that they too might be able to look unto you and be saved. So God, if you need to take my life and let it be,
wholly separated unto thee, that I might point the way, the truth, and the life. And God, I pray, whatever it takes. If that means that I have to be the fool, that you could be the faithful, if I have to be the tool, that you could be the master, if you can be the God Almighty who meets the needs of your people, then God, I pray you would do that today. And so the Lord spoke to me. And maybe he'll encourage you today as we go through this series, The Trying of Your Faith. Hope maketh not ashamed. I am the Lord. They shall not be ashamed that wait for me. Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which endureth to the within the, we the veil, and which into that, both sure and steadfast, and which endureth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus. You know, I think about people that tell me that, well, you know, you got to buy a gun because, after all, if somebody broke into your house, what are you going to do? You know, you got to protect yourself because what happens if you run on the street, you know, and you run into a gang? You know, it says, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. We have strong consolation. I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I have found myself in many times in situations before I became, you know, a minister of grace, a teacher of the word, a preacher of the gospel, that I had to go through some tough experiences that challenged my love uh, stretched my patience, perplexed me to no end, and even to this day, just pissed me off. <laughs> and that was when men judge men, or people judge one another, when God said, judge not. You see, people like to say that, well, we're not judging, we're evaluating. We're taking the circumstances and saying, we need to be able to be fruit inspectors, or we need to be able to make some kind of determination here so that we know what to do. As a matter of fact, God says, no, you don't. God says, you trust in me. You follow without me. You make me your refuge. You make me your wisdom. You make me your strength, and I will show you what to do. I will be your God, and you will be my people. So you have a choice every day to make, that you can follow the ways of man, or you can follow the will of God. The choice is always yours, but the determining factor of whether you will be a testimony to the glory of what God can do, or whether you will be a vessel of dishonor to what God is using anyways. You're going to be used by God, whether you like it or not. God will choose to use you as a vessel that he can prosper and he can cause the grace of God to come forth out of your life's experiences to be merciful unto other people, or he can use you and crush you to demonstrate what it's like to suffer the consequences of your own actions, the result of your own sin. You see, God is going to be faithful and true to the very end. He will demonstrate his perfect justice, his perfect righteousness, his perfect provision, his perfect defense. We who are poor and needy, we cry out day and night unto God because even when we have a roof over our head, or we have the basic necessities of life. There's still more that we want for others in our life. We want salvation unto some. We want provision for others. We want to be used by God. We want to minister for God. We want to be with God. And in reality, Jesus knows that, and he sees it. 
and he is satisfied with the desires of our heart. For if you would delight yourself in the Lord your God, he would give you the desires of your heart, if he is your desire, not so that you could take the things of God and use them for yourself. The majority of why the Christian church is ineffective and is not accomplishing God's will in the world today is because it's too busy spending the money on itself than using the investment of God to be invested in others. You see, if you would divest yourself of your increase and you kept 10% and God got 90, you would find yourself satisfied in the results with which God could accomplish his purpose in the world and the way. And one of the things that we've done in our life, my wife and I, unfortunately, is to take everything that we had of our life and to divest ourselves of our own personal gain so that we might be able to invest it in others. And so when we were sent here, that's what we did, was we divested ourselves of that with which would make us look foolish, but we could prepare ourselves also at the same time, which we did, in order to endure this particular trial we're going through. And so we did. We accomplished much with absolutely no ability to replenish. And God was faithful to bless us and to encourage us and to exhort us. And now we stand foolishly looking to God as our defense. Foolishly standing as though God were going to come through. Absolutely trusting whether we stay or whether we move, whether we remain or whether we go. But absolutely knowing that everything we've done, we've done in the name of the Son. And that I am so thrilled to be able to bear witness of the truth and the fact that my wife, who was weak in faith when she met me, who was not saved as I first came into contact with her, who has come from no faith to absolute trust in the Lord, has shown me and demonstrated for me the weakness of my own reality when I have doubted and worried and feared what God may use her and God may do for her, and God may act strong on her behalf, as he had done in the past, as he did as I saw what she had accomplished there in the place where we moved from in California with those businesses that were manipulating her and using her, and unfortunately just squeezing her. And then in the end, God blessed her. And I was amazed at how he did to bring us to the place we are today. So today... Now, we find ourselves in that challenge, and what would I do? What would a man of God, what will you do when you find yourself in the same circumstance where you are compressed in on every side? You are perplexed but not overcome. You are tried but not cast down. You are pressured but not overwhelmed. You are, as it were, nailed to the cross. Will you crawl down from that cross and say, God, no? Or will you say, God, yes? Because that's the test that you go through. We know that we whom we have believed in is able to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond anything that we are able to ask. And that would it be that we should ask, God would deliver. And so when he shall, I know that I shall be delivered. Because whether he deliver me in life or in death, whether he deliver me through prosperity or poverty, whether it be in height or depth, I know the love of God that he's given me and it's by his grace that I share with you the truth and the reality of my relationship that I have with Jesus. Because if I can't trust in my relationship with the Lord, based not upon my feelings, not upon the reality of the facts of circumstances of life compressing in on every side and saying, ha, what will he do now? Look at him. Where is his God now? If I can't trust in the Lord with all my heart, leaning not in my own understanding, but in all my ways acknowledge him and trust him to direct my path, and having been directed, be satisfied that this is his will, then I have no business being in the ministry, much less sharing with you the word of God. But you see, the truth is, whether we succeed in the ways that man perceive, or whether we be made fools for Jesus, and suffer the loss of all things, the one thing that we have given up at the cost of our own faith is the reality that we know whom we have believed, and we know whom we trust, and we know that Jesus will always be with us. So I am thrilled for the fact that my wife has come through this test and has been faithful and true to do the things that God told her to do.
that she alone is standing now at the crux of the mountaintop, looking to her God for salvation, that she stands on the cliff face, looking and seeing absolutely no way out, but only one way to do and to be and to live, and that's to trust in the Lord with all her heart. And if it's been my example of my life being made manifest to her in some way without telling her those things, that she has seen the same to true in me, then I am thrilled to say that Jesus can do for you what he has done for me. So let's see what the Lord may bring in this trying of our faith, in this test that we go through, in this example of a believer. Because if you don't live your life according to the will of God, then you will live your life according to the word of God. And the word of God is that the wrath of God is coming upon the world to judge the living and the dead. And that quickly soon now, Jesus will be coming here to take some who are prepared for his coming again. That are looking up and saying, even so come quickly, Lord Jesus. Even so come today, Lord Jesus. Even so, Jesus, as your name is God of salvation, bring your salvation. Even now, God, save us. Hoshana, Hosanna. Yehoshua, Hoshana. God is salvation, God save us. Or Jesus, Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus. I don't know how God may take me through this. I don't know what God may do in this. I don't know how God is going to accomplish this. But I do know this. God is with us. God is in us, and God is able to accomplish more than I would ever ask or dream or imagine. And that if he needs to use this in some way to minister to others, then my life will continue to be simply separated unto his will and not my own. I pray for you today that you would find in some way your faith, and that in finding your faith it would be tested, tried, and true. That no matter what comes, whether it be in rapture or whether you be left behind, that you will suffer disaster, that you will be enabled within those circumstances of your own consequences, maybe of sin or consequences of your own choices. But still, whether you have everything or nothing, you'll be able to stand in the midst of the rubble and thank God that you have Jesus. Choose you this day whom you will serve. For it's easy to serve the gods of men, or even the God of Christianity. But if you're serving the Lord Jesus Christ, then you're able to let him lead you and take his yoke upon you. And that you'll take up your cross today, and that you'll follow Jesus, no matter the price, no matter the cost. Choose you this day, today, to follow Jesus.